No, absolutely not. Abs I mean, this is not the team of the 90s. If Quincy doesn't get cut, I think that I'd probably end up on practice squad, if that was possible. Maybe they cut me and I'm playing for somebody else. I couldn't make myself do it. I was just like, done. If we did not want to play, Cleveland didn't want to play, it was a lousy game, she had never played it. His future was limitless. A moment in football history on the grandest of stages when nothing stood between him and immortality. Percy Howard raced away from Hall of Fame defensive back Mel Blunt before cradling Roger Staubach's pass as the ball fell into his arms. The touchdown, his touchdown, brought the Dallas Cowboys ever so closer in their Super Bowl X battle against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Percy Howard only caught one pass, a touchdown pass uh, against one of the great defensive backs of all time. I, I, I had confidence in Percy. I mean, it's, Percy's kind of one of those mystery stories that, uh, uh, and you know, they, they just, I, I, I don't think, made some great decisions on giving Percy the opportunities that he had. Percy Howard's first career NFL catch immediately transformed him into a Super Bowl hero a legend in the mythology of America's team. That catch, however, would be his last. The moment, his moment, would vanish as quickly as it came. The mountaintop would soon crumble. A limitless future, gone. Well, I can tell you, uh, a lot of things contributed to a downfall. Uh, when you're used to being in the limelight, used to having, and anything you want, you can just go get it. And wherever you go, it's like cheers. Everybody knows your name. Um, and then the transition period, when that hits, it's almost like a culture shock. It's just the whole world has just flipped. It was all because of the touchdown catch. Now, had he not made the touchdown catch and some other catch, probably he would not have had that notoriety. But it was that Super Bowl X, people remembered that. To this day, they remember that. Yeah, I love Percy Howard. I, I love that boy. But like all of us, man, sometimes, man, you turn the corner and a truck hits you. Today we were here because we wanted to give testimony to the life of Percy Howard, some of the things that he has done in his life. None of us know all of the things. We showed up as witnesses. The cameras are going back there. But there's one thing that I know, that as a middle brother, I have seen him go through the low times, the difficult times, to the height of scoring a touchdown in Super Bowl X. Percy Howard's life began simply enough. His parents, Fleming and Gladys, lived in Rincon, Georgia, a small town just 18 miles south of Savannah. They were poor, with Fleming working six days a week as a carpenter and also raising the majority of the family's food on a small farm in their backyard. They were married for 18 years had no children. Then they had Norris, my oldest brother. Then after that, they had nine, seven boys and two girls. The youngest of these seven boys is Percy. And uh, from there, uh, I guess it all began. Well, it was never lonely because there was always kids around, you know, it's the way it was. And during those days, we didn't have a lot. 
you know, so we uh, stuck together, you know, and by me being the oldest, well, I always had to make sure that I could protect them. My mother not only was a great cook, she was a great nurturer. She, uh, she set a foundation for us early on in life about how life should be. We understood there would be struggles, we understood all that, but it was the way that she loved us all. Percy and one of his brothers moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida to live with a local pastor, and within a year, the rest of his family followed. The brothers would attend Dillard High School, which has one of the richest high school football traditions in the country, sending 20 players, including all-pro wide receiver Isaac Bruce, to the NFL. Ask longtime observers, though, and there's no doubt who is the greatest athlete the school has ever produced. He was a, he was a, he ran, he was a sprinter, he was all right, a sprinter, a discus thrower, high jumper, he was a well-rounded athlete. And uh, for his size, he had uh, exceptional speed. He was just a natural, just a natural. You don't have to do much with a young man who already possess uh, certain skills that you want. Because I needed, me, I always had to have me a person to be close by the board that I call a hatchet man. Got to have somebody to get the ball. And he fit the category real well. You know, no training or nothing to school. He was a phenomenal athlete in the size, you know, at that time, you know, uh, growing up being, you know, wasn't seven foot, was, you know, a person who's six four, six five, and um, you know, he was uh, could do all things, run, you know, jump, basketball, football. He just was a, uh, you know, uh, all around athlete. As a senior, Percy led Dillard High School to the Class A state championship game, which was highlighted by a state tournament record: thirty three rebounds in an epic twenty nine point comeback in the semifinals. Percy led the team in scoring and rebounding and was named first team All-State. Well, we had, uh, we had an excellent my basketball team. Uh, and what we had was we had different athletes. We had, uh, we had balance and we had people coming behind you that were also talented. I used to come and watch, you know, I don't stay too far from here, but I was at Deerfield coaching. But uh, any time Dill play, I would come to the games because they were dynamite. They were dynamite the team. But I would pray that in some of your lives that it would be very strong because it would be touching, Mother. It would make us realize a sense of responsibility, a sense of duty. That you don't look at other people before you look inside of yourself. Because these young babies are looking at us. These children are looking at us. They're looking at what we do. They're hearing what we say. So we as a people need to understand who we are in Christ. After graduating from high school in the spring of 1970, Percy spent a year at Isothermal Community College in Spindale, North Carolina before landing a scholarship at Austin P. State University in Clarksville, Tennessee. While Percy was forced to sit out the 1971-72 season as a junior college transfer, stories of his athleticism and his leaping exploits quickly spread around the campus, inspiring a nickname that has stayed with him the rest of his life. And what was the nickname? Bird. Yes, uh, because, uh, you know, actually one day it was almost like I did fly in uh, Sunland Park. We were playing a pickup game with Blanche Ely. Well, I got the pass coming from the wing, and once I got the pass, he was coming, and so people expect you to lay it up. If I lay it up, he's going to block it. Well, we're coming in. We haven't got to the top of the key yet, so something just said go. Boom, and I went up in the air and I just stayed up there. And I stayed up and I had the ball like this. And at the last moment, boom, and I stuffed it. But as soon as I hit the floor, all of my energy was gone. I almost couldn't run, I couldn't do nothing. I stayed up there too long. One story that began circulating on campus was that Percy could take a quarter off the top of the backboard. 
Now this is a guy that's 6'4". He's not 6'11 or 7'1". Yeah, I've been told about that when he was at Austin P. and he actually put a quarter. My dad used to tell us that story and how he actually jumped up and put a quarter on the backboard. So when he told me that, guess what? I'm heading to the gym. I never got it up there though. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing that he uh, he was able to you know do that I wasn't. Austin P. had an All-American long jumper who was also the school record holder in the 100-yard dash. So he and Percy lined up. They didn't, they didn't start out of blocks, but they said, all right, let's have a little showdown to see who's faster. So someone gave them the go sign and they sprinted their 100 yards, absolute dead heat. That also showed, gosh, if this guy can keep up with a sprinter for someone that muscular, that was just absolutely amazing. Percy's life began changing both on and off the court. And for the better, he and Patricia were married and soon welcomed a daughter, Pamela, into the family. And with the addition of freshman sensation Fly Williams, one of the leading scorers in the country, Austin P. won the Ohio Valley Conference in Percy's first season on the court, earning a berth in the 1973 NCAA tournament where they would face mighty Kentucky in the regional semifinal. Despite pushing them to the brink, they lost to the Wildcats in triple overtime. So the, the, the feeling is, would Austin P show up or would they get deer in the headlights and not play against Kentucky? Well, the team showed up, the fans showed up, and we outplayed them all game long. It was a great time for us, but we were a, a basketball team that was carrying a city. Uh, Clarksville, Tennessee uh, had not had the successes that a lot of the other cities had had. So it, we were happy that we won, okay, but we felt that we could defeat uh, Kentucky and that's why it went into trouble overtime. And <laughs> I can tell you they had some great players too. It was like uh, just boom, 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 boom. And they, I think they ended up winning 100 to 106, something like that. But it was, a, it was great for us, but it, it set a signal that we, we came to play and that we had good preparations, we had good coaches. So um, we were ready for the action. When, 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 the, when the bell rung, we, we would answer the bell. That was truly a magical moment for anyone who'd been around this athletic program for a long time or any period at all. It was a total embracing of the community that never had occurred before. It was an absolutely thrilling day. For those of us that would study life, why are we here? Why was Riley Howard born on December 10th, 1947? Why? Not because I chose to, not because you chose to. It's because God chose you. And he chose us because he has a purpose for our life, work for us to do, people for us to know, to meet and to greet, and to show some love to. Yes. How many of y'all know that God is love? Yes. Not just some of the time, but God is love. All the time. Percy finished his three seasons at Austin P as one of the leading scorers and rebounders in program history. However, despite not having played a down of college football, it was the NFL who came calling in the spring of his senior year. Even though he eventually got offers from four NBA teams and two other NFL clubs, he ended up signing with the Cowboys as an undrafted free agent. We both assumed that he would play for the NBA. That was almost a given, and uh, we didn't see anything other than that because he was such an outstanding player that um, it just seemed uh, the only thing to, to do. We worked him out, and he ran about 4.25 or something like that, and, and when I say 4.25, it was like on a cinder uh, track, and uh, you know we looked at each other and uh, said, you know what, we're going to sign this guy. I ran it against the wind, too. So I had gotten fast. I had gotten, this is what I'm saying, it was a blessing from the Lord. It, it was a blessing from the Lord. But to see 
non-football players getting an opportunity to the Cowboys back then wasn't unusual. Uh, so it wasn't unusual that, you know, Percy was there. Cornell Green was a former basketball player. He had made great strides and, of course, been a... Gil Brandt and the staff always look for those kind of athletes that they think can trans, uh, tran transfer their particular sport they're playing in, into an NFL game. And they saw that in Percy. Percy Howell was a basketball player. Um, but when you looked at his body, I mean, he was, um, he was secretariat. He was Muhammad Ali. He, was, he had muscles on his Achilles. Yeah, well, Percy, Percy was uh, tall and uh, great hands. He was, a, he was a very good basketball player, and uh, he uh, uh, had good speed, and he, he looked like this, you know, this, this could be a really uh, a great receiver for the Cowboys, yeah. His teammates were impressed with Percy's athleticism and physique, and his position coach thought the college basketball star was ready for more playing time on the gridiron. The issue was convincing head coach Tom Landry. I always believe in two things, attitude and character. He had those. He wanted to play. He terrific effort guy. I mean, I had to defend him. I mean, I had to go into Tom and, you know, we had to evaluate our receivers uh, all the time, you know, every week. And, and uh, I kept him on the list and I, you know, he said, well, I think we ought to cut this guy. I said, no, coach. I said, this guy, he's, he's the kind of player you'll love. I mean, he's got a heart to play the game. I don't care about the talent. Talent is a, a minor part of the equation. You've got to have the, you've got to have the will, the character, the attitude to go out there and play and give it your all. Sometimes you're going to come up short, but he's a guy that uh, I, I just saw what I liked in him, you know. The thing that was most noticeable about him when he came was his size, okay? <laughs> Receivers weren't that big back then, you know, about 6'4", 215, uh, so that was noticeable. But then the other thing was his athletic ability. And the third thing was intelligence level. You know, he grasped Coach Landry's offense uh, pretty early in the process as a rookie. The problem was Landry was never a fan of playing any rookie, much less an undrafted free agent basketball player. You know, that's the way Coach was, was that's the way he was his whole career. That's the way it was when he played and then when he coached. You know, to, to play as a rookie, you really had to earn that. That, that was this pretty special thing. It was a situation of, kind of been blessed, hoping that uh, my time, my shot would come. God wants us to make sure that we understand that he is present. And that because we are here, he wants you to hear. But it's not just about any of us. It's about all of us. It's not just about you, it's about all of us, that there is a plan for each one of us. It's divine that we need to understand. While Percy didn't catch a pass or really see any snaps besides on special teams during the 1975 season, the Cowboys went 10 and four. They won a pair of playoff games, including the famed Hail Mary victory at Minnesota in the wild card round to find themselves facing Pittsburgh in Super Bowl X, a game that was played in Miami, near Percy's Southern Florida home. The defending champion and favorite Steelers were leading 21 to 10, with less than three minutes remaining, when an unknown wideout was sent into the game to replace an injured Golden Richards. And I knew one thing, Mike Ditka, <laughs> I know he was always after Coach Man, he would always, he grabbed me, and he'd be walking, he'd pull me, that's why I was always near Coach Landry. Because at the Super Bowl, when uh, Golden went down, he just touched me. And they said, go. And boy, was I ready to go. You know, you, you don't go to Super Bowls every year. You know, you might, in your lifetime, you may never go to one as a football player. So to be able to go there, and I wanted my guys all to play. I really did. I wanted them to play and feel like they were contributing. That's what I felt. And, and Coach Landry really felt the same way. After running a couple of routes one-on-one -on -one against arguably the greatest defensive back of his generation, Mel Blunt, Percy went back to the Cowboys huddle and told Roger Staubach that he could get open. The quarterback took the play, which was called Fire Slant 24 Wing 7, to Tom Landry during the two-minute warning, and the head coach agreed. Shotgun formation for Dallas. 
Snap the Starbuck, drops back. I worked with him in the offseason and uh, threw to him, so I had confidence in him. And and he's a, he's a big guy, so I was going to, uh, you know, take advantage of it in, in that game when he got in there. When Roger got the play, he said, okay, Bird. And uh, Drew said, all you got to do is stay outside. I said, okay. So when I moved up to the line, I looked at man, he was looking at me. Naturally, he didn't know what was going to happen. Well, I came off the line slow. It wasn't too slow, but I came off like I was doing nothing. And then I burst into speed. Boom. And I did. I kept him in a tight spin, and I ran right past him. He steps forward and goes for the end zone. Look out down there. It's going to be a touchdown for the Dallas Cowboys. Percy Howard got the on Mel Blunt. Blood trying to handle him, couldn't keep up with him, and Percy Howard, a rookie from Austin Pay, for a great catch for the Dallas Cowboys. When I turned around, there was the ball, and at the same time, there was Mel Blunt's eyes about that big, and Roger laid it right in there, and man, oh man, boom, touchdown. I was jumping up and down, screaming, and I was so excited, I could hardly stand it. Yes, that was one of the highlights of my life. And I remember taking the football, flipping it to the, the official, and I went off the field, and who was there? It was Mike Ditka. He was standing there like I knew it, like, and, and this, this was it, and I said, oh, God. And there's Coach Lane. He just looked at me. I could see how proud he was. And, uh, but we were still down, and uh, we had to have another one. The score now 21-17. to 17. The Cowboys got the ball back with one last chance to score. Their best opportunity coming on a Hail Mary attempt in the closing seconds from Pittsburgh's 38-yard line. The intended target? Percy Howard. Here it is, the direct snap to Roger Staubach. Staubach has lots of time. He's going for the bomb. He's got a man down there, and we've got a defender back there, and it is incomplete. J.T. Thomas breaks it up. Percy Howard was the intended receiver. Everyone thought I was going to get it. Right there, I didn't even get to time my jump. If I could have taken time to get in time my jump the way I wanted to, I would have been able to go up high enough to get that ball. But this was the lack of experience because I've thought about it. Interference, yeah, we should have got a call on that play. There's no question about it. And we were going to Percy because of his size and athletic ability. You know, throw it up there and see if you can make the catch and uh, bring it down. And, uh, you know, it's a 50-50 chance of that happening. I actually got kicked in the gonads. I mean, I got, I was in pain. I, I'm standing there like this because when I went up, I got kicked in the, so well. At any rate, that was that play. Despite the defeat, a couple of weeks after the Super Bowl, Percy returned to Fort Lauderdale as no less than a conquering hero. I was about six years old and, um, from my last memory is when he caught the touchdown in Super Bowl 10 and I was um, he was the biggest thing in the whole area you know that's all you ever heard anybody talk about and everyone was proud of and um, you know to come out of that area and accomplish what he's accomplished was just unheard of it was a very proud a very proud moment because a lot of people all over town they were saying that uh, it, he was like a hero you know they was welcoming him back like a hero you know and, and that made us very proud yeah I said, wow, I'm glad to see that uh, he made it, you know, it was very nice. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't go out to a restaurant without people coming up to him and wanting to surround him and wanting his autograph and this kind of thing. Uh, we couldn't walk down the street. Um, our private lives were gone. Um, and if we visited Florida or Tennessee, it was the same thing because people knew him. To me, that was a peaceful moment you know, to be able to uh, make, um, establish that kind of accomplishment, bring that pass in, because everyone dreams of that pass. Everyone dreams of hitting the last shot in the game and, you know, things like that. So to me, that's something that should always uh, be recognized and, and respected because not many people in the population get to, get not only get that opportunity, but actually seize the opportunity.
It's about you and what you are purposed for in this life and who we are supposed to be. You're going to have, Percy, your up and downs. You're going to have your trials and your tribulations. But through it all, God made a promise to not just some of us, but to all of us. He said, I will never leave you. I will forsake you. Percy appeared poised to land a starting job in 1976 and was enjoying an impressive preseason when he suffered a devastating knee injury while running a reverse against Denver. Though the Cowboys kept him on the roster for two more years, Percy would never play another game. At one point, a teammate asked him when he was going to be back. Percy responded, whenever the Lord wills it. The teammate quipped, maybe the Lord wants you to sell insurance. You know, the play sports, you know, there's a, there's a luck factor. I mean, you can have all the talent in the world, but if you get hurt, you blow out a knee, uh, you know. I, you, you see it happen to so many guys, you know. You know, then once training camp hit, you know, he was rolling. You know, he was having a good training camp until, you know, he was uh, beset with injuries. And, you know, it's just unfortunate because what's unfortunate is you don't know how far his talent could have taken him. You know, he could have been a great story in the NFL as far as making that transition from basketball to football and having success doing it. We didn't have the technical knowledge at the time for them to fix the knee the way that they could fix it today, which caused great problems because once we rehabilitated and uh, prepared to go back out on the field, made a sharp turn, boom, the knee just popped away again. And then we rehabilitated again, went back out on the field, make a turn, boom, the knee popped again. Percy was 26 years old when his athletic career unceremoniously ended in 1978. As his life fell apart and substance abuse took control of his world, he held a variety of jobs. In security, as a private investigator, managing a couple of nightclubs, even dabbling in professional boxing and martial arts. I think the way it ended for him, you know, he definitely wasn't prepared. Who was prepared for that? You know, you think you're going to play forever and uh, you don't. And I can tell you this from going through all the surgeries and all these things, I got hooked on the drugs and those things, they also contributed because now I also have an excuse. I can say that, uh, well, I am on this drug because of this. But the thing was, once you get taken over by something like that, not only does it take you over here, it takes over the people that are around you. And when you begin to lose that, you become something that is so different. I don't know what he got his hands on, but he was a curious uh, you know, person when it came to substances. He was curious, like me. Uh, Percy and I had, um, we used together. As his post-career drug and alcohol use increased, Percy's family was paying the price, particularly his sons, Philip and Patrick, who were seeing less and less of their father, their hero. It was some of everything. It was partying, it was alcohol, it was drugs, it was women. It was everything. And he would tell me sometimes that he was going out of town and he wasn't out of town. He'd just be gone days at a time and because he wasn't checking in, he just let me know, well, I'm not gonna, you know, be in town. And then I found out because I was taking some of his clothes to the cleaners that he had an apartment on the side in North Dallas that I did not even know about. Well, it happened when, uh... My dad would just be home less and less. And then when he was home, they'd be arguing. And I'd hear him, you know, through the floor, you know, it's an upstairs. I was slept in the upstairs room. I'd hear him arguing about things. I could tell they weren't happy. Then my dad would leave, wouldn't see him for a while. And then I'd find out that, you know, he had a bunch of pictures of him and other girls. And, and then my mom did tell me that, you know, she's divorcing him because, you know, he, he's getting, he got somebody else pregnant. At some point, I remember becoming aware that there was some type of trouble in the house and I'm feeling some tension. And next thing I know, I remember uh, my, my dad took my brother and I to Red Lobster and uh, was talking about D-Day. 
That's what he said, D-Day and the divorce and everything. I remember it was just, it was earth shattering for me. It was just, it was mind racking. Uh, I just remember being uh, consumed with pain. In the late 1990s, Percy found himself before a Dallas judge after he roughed up yet another man at one of his nightclubs. The offer was simple, either leave Texas or face jail time. Percy decided to return home to Fort Lauderdale. He then lost what little money he had on the bus ride, arriving without a dime. Well, I, I, I didn't know exactly where I was going to go or what I was going to do. And so we're looking at now at one great transition period uh, because I didn't know. I am absent from that time in his life and there are missing parts to the puzzle that I don't know about. Once he moved to Florida, I heard rumors of things that happened. I heard that he was homeless. Just one day my phone rang and it was Percy. And you know, he didn't tell me he was doing bad. He didn't tell me he needed help, but he did kind of signal that, you know, can I come over and see you? And I go, yeah, come see me. And when I saw him, it was, um, wasn't the guy that I remembered. I can remember the time <clears throat> then when my little brother was going through some struggles, I'm sure there were people that gave up on him. But God never did. And the question would be, how do you know? Because there he sit, looking like my daddy. There he sit, being a servant. Amen? Through it all, y'all being a servant. I don't care what is written. What I know is that God lifted him up, gave him a mission, and gave him a purpose. And ever since he's been working with us, he have not quit. Before the darkness and the depression, before the drugs and the alcohol overtook him, Percy enjoyed many fond memories with his family. In many ways, he was living the American dream with a loving wife, a high school English teacher, no less, and three healthy, beautiful children. Well, I remember um, when I was a kid, like uh, kids would talk about, you know, uh, their father. Oh, my dad can beat your dad. My dad can beat up your dad. But I always remember feeling like I didn't even need to participate in that conversation because my dad was like the Superman. He was very involved in my childhood up to a certain age. You know, um, he was the coach of my, one of the coaches of my football, of uh, fifth grade football team, and one of the coaches of my sixth grade football team, and one of the coaches of my fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade basketball team. When they were still together, I remember, um, I remember just having a loving family. I was too young to be able to perceive the, 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 the any struggles in the household or anything, but, um, I just remember, you know, a loving family. I was the youngest in the household. I felt really safe and uh, I just felt loved. But by the early 1990s, with his substance abuse approaching its peak, Percy was a mostly absent father. He was gone for days at a time with no explanation. Eventually, after 17 years of marriage, Patricia's patience finally wore thin and she filed for divorce. Meanwhile, Percy's youngest son, Patrick, followed in his father's footsteps, starring in multiple sports at Rowlett High School, a suburb of Dallas, where he earned all district honors as a tight end. Uh, I signed with Oklahoma State, but uh, I, I visited uh, Texas A&M. Um, I was getting heavily recruited by TCU. Um, got letters from just about everybody. Um, would he come to any games? No, he never came to any of my games. Yeah, that's tough because, you know, I adored my dad. I adored his career. Uh, I adored his, his, his accomplishments. I was really proud of him. I wanted him to see what I was doing. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. I'm thinking, at least come to the games. At least call them on their birthdays, send a card, maybe a gift. He didn't even call them on their birthdays, and that was very hurtful to me. And I'm thinking, this is not the person that I thought I was marrying. I thought he would have been the best father in the world. 
and that did not happen. And that's, that's when I got into trouble, you know, started getting, you know, going into the streets, doing things, and, you know, like going out fighting and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, if my dad was around, I wouldn't have gotten into stuff like that. Man, as the head of the household, as we were raised to believe and then to not just to go headless the way that we did, um, it, it impacted us the way that you would expect it to, and even some ways worse, you know, so. When he moved to Florida, hmm, actually I was in the penitentiary. You, you, you went to jail? Mm-hmm. <laughs> how, how long did you spend? 14 years and nine months. Kind of, you know, kind of a long time. <laughs> it was pretty devastating because I was daddy. I was the strength of the house. Uh, it had to affect them because my leadership at that house, nothing was going to go wrong at that house and whatever needed to be done, uh, that it could do it. And by them not having that, it had to hurt them. And they could, even today, they, it hurts them even today. And I know that, that's why if I had to say anything to my children at this time, it would be that I failed you. there are difficult times. Surely there is hard times. Surely there is times yes. when you feel even God has turned against you. Yes. But look at you now. You're a living testimony yes. of what God can do yes. and what he has done. Yes. For those that are not believers, shame on you. I was, a, I was, I was not a believer for 30 years. But when I came into the church, I don't know how to half do anything. I do know when I look my brother in the eye, I got to tell him, I understand where we came from, but I also understand where we're going. Because what I can't do, what you can't do, God will do it for you. After a life once filled with so much promise reached rock bottom, with Percy at one point even living out of a car purchased for him by former teammates Thomas Henderson and Roger Staubach, he received an invitation from his older brother, Wiley, to live with his family and come work at his St. James Missionary Baptist Church in Pompano Beach. And so once I heard about those consequences, uh, yes, I do think that when he hit bottom and I heard about it, I did not talk about it. I went to see what I could do to help my brother out of that circumstance. Um, when you go so far down, when you lose so much of yourself, when you understand a growth pattern, which I do, and once you see that happens, when things materialize the way that you began to want them to do, then you begin to feel it. You begin to feel better. You become one once again with yourself and you began to understand why you were put here and I think getting the Lord back involved in my life. And all of that had a lot to do with it. There's nothing more positive than being able to speak with the Lord. And that's a personal thing, but uh, those things help you gather yourself back again. He's got a great heart. He's always wants to tell everybody that you know the best, the best that he knows, and and, and try to and try to uh, help people to learn from from his knowledge and his mistakes. And yeah, he does that. Over the last few years, Percy has reconnected with his children, asking for their forgiveness and trying to rebuild those relationships, much as he has rebuilt his own life. His youngest son, Patrick even moved to Fort Lauderdale to be closer to his father. I think he did have some remorse. I think he did. I think he knew that um, he should have kept his family intact. I think he just made some bad decisions. And he, I think I did see some remorse in him. He just, uh, it was more remorse, kind of like being ashamed of himself. Yeah, I think he would have liked to have, uh, looking back, I think he would have liked to have, have kept his family and, and being us be together. He does have some guilt, I think regret even. We're uh, very congenial to each other at this point, and we recognize the fact that both of those children are our children, the, uh, both of the sons and, and the daughter in California. Um, and uh, he realizes that he's made mistakes. 
and he has honored that. And I do appreciate the fact that he finally admitted that, you know, I was wrong. And uh, he um, just tried to own up. And so he's a much better person today than he was 30 years ago. I'm proud of him. I feel like he's uh, he's at a good place. I, I like the, I like, I like, um, he just seems like he's got his, his head is together. As far as trying to make things right, um, I'm no, I don't know that that's, that, that is there. Actually, yes, it is because he reaches out and he, he, he tells me, you know, to, to reach out to my family and he, he, you know, talks to my sister and brother. So actually, yeah, I would say that he is. I say in his own way, he is trying to make it right. Oh, yes. Yeah, I forgive him. You have to forgive in order to move on. In order to become a better person, you have to forgive and you have to let things go and let, you know, let situations work themselves out because, like they say, uh, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I'll tell you this, um, I love my children dearly. And the thing is, sometimes you have to reach out. And I had to, of course, reach out and let them know, hey, Dad's here. Dad is, it's, it's here. Because after giving away so much and taking away so much from them, then it's time for either you recover or you continue to dig that hole. So, and I love them enough to say, okay, here we are, let's, let's go from here. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you're nobody. Because we serve a God that serves everybody, that loves everybody. So how about this? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. Uh -huh.